All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Cody, Marketing Coordinator at HBS Online, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. For the last two years, HBS Online has partnered with a nonprofit to support a community in need. Through what we call the Community Challenge, our learners have gathered around the world to help organizations solve one of their most pressing challenges. Back in May, HBS Online partnered with Sustainable Harvest International. SHI challenged the HBS Online community to craft a business plan that helps them in their mission of reversing climate change and fighting rural poverty. Eight chapters submitted nine proposals, and after much deliberation, SHI selected the Los Angeles Chapter Solution as the winner. I'd like to introduce Florence Reed, founder and director of strategic growth at Sustainable Harvest International, and Mathe Rubino, a business consultant, entrepreneur, and team member of the LA Community Chapter. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Thank I have having. Yeah, I have some questions prepared for both of you, and we will also be taking some questions from the audience in a bit. Um, so, audience members, if you're watching on Zoom, you can use the Q and A function. And if you're joining us on Facebook or LinkedIn, feel free to leave a comment there. So, Flo, um, let's let's start with you. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about what Sustainable Harvest International does? I'd be glad to. Thank you. Um, well, since 1997, Sustainable Harvest International has been supporting local farmer training programs in Central America that teach regenerative agroecology practices. Um, the real focus being on uh, building and maintaining soil health and increasing biodiversity on the farms. And we do this by hiring local trainers who work side by side with the farmers and their families for a number of years and help those families who previously had inadequate food and income to grow a diversity of healthy crops, both for their own consumption and also to sell for income. And uh, those crops also include uh, trees and so the farming techniques, in addition to helping the families, also increase biodiversity and stabilize the climate, uh, as well as having other social and environmental benefits. So uh, since 1997, we've helped uh, approximately 3,000 families to achieve food security and improve their standard of living. Uh, while also improving the environment, those families have planted 4 million trees, they've converted nearly 30,000 acres of degraded land to these regenerative agroecology practices. And they continue to do so long after they graduate from the program. A, a survey that we did not too long ago of graduates found that years after finishing the program, 91% are still using the practices they learned with us. That's amazing, thanks. And you're also the founder of SHI. So what inspired you to start SHI? Well, um, if, if we go way back, I, I think ever since uh, my childhood, I've had a real love for nature and the diversity of life on our planet. And that's something that continued to grow as I grew older. And I also became aware of the fact that most people on the planet, unfortunately, aren't as lucky as I was to be born into a family where I never had to worry about whether we were gonna be able to meet our basic needs. And all of this, I think, really came into focus when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Panama and lived in a small rural community. And while I was there, I, I got to see firsthand things that I had studied in college, uh, particularly uh, about tropical deforestation and its connection to slash and burn farming. Uh, where farmers were doing short rotation slash and burn, um, where they would burn some forest um, grow some crops, and then as the soil was depleted, move on and burn some more forest, uh, which I think worked at one time, but now the farmers have to go back after a short time and burn again what's grown back. And, and in this situation, the land gets depleted um, fairly rapidly. And what really came home to me as a Peace Corps volunteer was the fact that the farmers really would prefer to have sustainable farming practices that would allow them to grow on the same land year after year, not have uh, the work and the environmental impact of having to cut down more forest every year, 
but they were simply lacking sufficient technical assistance to get comfortable and successfully make that transition to sustainable practices. Um, and then the other thing I learned in, in the Peace Corps was um, how local trainers are gonna be much more effective uh, than foreigners uh, coming in to do the training. Although I think Peace Corps is wonderful for, for many uh, reasons, but local trainers are, are more effective. Um, and also I, I saw the importance of a multiple year approach that you can't expect farmers to change the way they've been growing their crops for generations uh, overnight. So all of that led me to, to see um, this need and, and eventually to be shocked to find there was no organization that was focusing on providing that kind of technical assistance to the farmers. Um, so after working for a couple of other nonprofits and getting a little more experience and eventually in, in 1997, um, I founded Sustainable Harvest International uh, to, to fill that, that need that wasn't being met otherwise. That's amazing. Yeah. And um, I know that I'm definitely really glad that we got to partner with, S with SHI for this community challenge. Um, and I'm wondering about what inspired you to, do, to join the community challenge this year? Um, well, we, we just felt so lucky when we were invited to join the community challenge. It came, um, the invitation came at the perfect time in Sustainable Harvest International's evolution as an organization. We've recently uh, begun to look very seriously at how to scale up our impact to a more global level, seeing the very serious environmental threats um, that are uh, planet is facing. We felt like we needed to do more and part of uh, our multi-pronged approach to scaling up is to look at how we can bring down the net cost of providing the technical assistance to the farmers. And part of what that uh, we think sh should look like is having an earned income component. So having a business uh, attached to our training program that ideally will um, both help the farmers, but also generate income for our nonprofit and offset the, the costs of uh, providing that training. Um, but at Sustainable Harvest International, um, we are, for the most part, uh, not uh, business people. Um, thankfully, we have some on our board of directors, but um, well, we do not, that's not really our, our wheelhouse. And so we saw that we needed help from people with uh, good business training and business background to help us look at, at how to bring this business component into our scaling up plans. And Harvard Business School Online um, clearly has a large pool of, of alumni who uh, have that uh, excellent business education and uh, has have the experience and they could bring their minds to work on, on this issue that we're addressing of how to bring the business component into SHI's scaling up plans. And um, we, we were, uh, thrilled with the diversity of uh, perspectives that we could get from all of Harvard Business School's online uh, global chapters around the world and, and all the experience that, that they brought to this challenge. That's fantastic. And also a nice segue into saying hi to Mafe. How are you? How thank are you, Mafe? For having, uh, very good, very well. I, thank you for having me here. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, why did you become involved with the HBS online community? Um, well, I had seen the, the advertisement of Harvard Business Online back in 2017, and it was on entrepreneurship essential. So I had applied and became the, uh, got involved with the first cohort of entrepreneurship essential in October 2017. Um, and um, since then, um, I get close with some of the um, people in my cohort. And to this day, we're still uh, communicating, even though we have not seen each other face to face. And uh, ha however, in the last couple of years, I had attended um, uh, Connects, which is the gathering for HBS online. So I had met other people from other uh, courses uh, other alumni and uh, we had formed other communities and get involved with other communities as well. And so what a great uh, way to actually being uh, connected and uh, being involved too. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And um, what motivated you to take part in the community challenge this year? Well, um, there, there are three, uh, the cause had resonated um, three reasons for me. One, um, I am a granddaughter of a farmer from the Philippines and uh, had been in the farm when it's school break. Um, it's, uh, it's my cousins and, uh, uh, and some of my friends uh, think for us to look forward and get to the farm and uh, catch some snails and all this and uh, climb trees. So um, it, it was back in the days, <laughs> it brings back memories. And um, uh, I'm also, um, uh, because, I'm a, because I'm a vegetarian, uh, regenerative far farming becomes more meaningful to me uh, since I became that. Uh, the source of food that nourish our body became, becomes very important. When, uh, of course, uh, time in the beginning, there's already um, uh, organic farming and all this when some of the fertilizers were not introduced. But I remember in the day when my grandfather was called on a meeting to introduce what's called fertilizer. But prior to that, we, they didn't use it. It was in the backyard, gathering the leaves that surrounded the, the dry leaves that surrounded the tree to actually make it as a fertilizer for the tree, you know? And uh, so, some of the things that, that we actually didn't realize is that there is this inherent wisdom in the farm from the farmers that some of the people doesn't really know. And uh, I would sometimes wonder how can we include that when people are collecting data, how can we include that wisdom that actually come from these people? You know, because it cannot just be, um, a lot of data has been collected, but how can we capture that, that, that wisdom from the farm? And uh, the third thing is, um, the reversing the effects of climate change, whether we believe it or not, some of the things that actually change in our environment. One is when, when farmers can actually tell when to plant, when to harvest, and when to, to, to do this next cycle, some of these things are disrupted. The, the weather had changed. And so how can they cope up with this when the weather is changed and there is no rain? So even if we don't call it climate change, what would the, what we we call it something else? But something actually had changed, and something is threatening the way we could actually produce our food. So this is just something you know that we have to be aware of. Definitely, yeah. And I'm so glad that that connects back to your um, to your grandparents, like you were talking about. That is very meaningful. Um, Flo, what, what kind of response did you receive from the HBS online community? Um, really, we were overwhelmed um, with the response that we received. Um, not, not just that there were nine proposals from uh, eight chapters, but, but the quality and um, the diversity of the responses that we got, um, you know, everything uh, from uh, ideas about using technology in a different way to uh, new marketing ideas. Uh, the Sao Paulo chapter uh, had some great ideas about a trade fair, uh, which was something we hadn't thought about before, but uh, we, we can certainly see the, the potential of. Uh, and, and in addition to the diversity of responses, uh, it wasn't you know just that they were uh, sending a paragraph or two, and the, these were really substantial uh, proposals. Uh, I think uh, Tokyo um, had uh, nearly sixty pages, um, and all like really quality <laughs> uh, material that is very interesting and and useful uh, for us. We've already. Uh, started to see some benefits. The Istanbul uh, chapter with another one of the finalists, they've uh, helped us to connect with some rotary clubs in, in Belize and in Honduras. And we're already uh, into second or third round of conversations with those rotary clubs in Honduras about helping to, to spread our, our work there. And um, in the coming year, 
uh, we plan to dive deeper into all of the proposals um, and look at which ones we can start integrating uh, in, into our work and how we can continue to work with some of the members of, of the chapters who have kindly offered to maintain a connection with us and to continue to uh, help us move our work forward. Um, and, and, and so many of the ideas just fit in uh, so well with what Sustainable Harvest is looking to achieve and, and helping to connect us to the, the broader world, which um, makes sense given the uh, global reach of uh, the Harvard Business School online chapters. Uh, I think the um, LA group as, as well as the, the Tokyo group uh, talked about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and, and how, how they can fit in with spreading our message, uh, maybe to find new corporate sponsors or, uh, or other ways to, to further our work. Uh, so re really we just couldn't uh, be happier with, with the response that we got. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Just like getting to sit in and listen to the finalist proposals being presented was amazing. I mean, Mafe, you and everybody else did a fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about the ideas that were in the Los Angeles chapter's proposal? Um, well, in, the, in creating our proposal, there were three, um, three major um, things that were um, three major points that uh, HSI had uh, given us during this challenge. One is the marketing and selling of products, the uh, selling of appropriate uh, services, tools, and equipment to the farmers, and the identification of larger in institutions that um, in the area that would be able to in, um, to uh, strike interest and uh, uh, help with the agricultural production and training for small farmers. So in, in considering these three areas, we actually wanted to have integrated solution. We don't want to just address one area of marketing. We incorporated, all, so we divided our team into groups and we all address each of the three um, areas. And then we presented all our all our ideas to the group and we vetted each one you know we actually for for the subscription box idea we actually um uh, say these are the possible problems and the, these are the solution posted this kind of challenges and so we tweak some of our ideas in accordance to what's happening in the in the situation because uh, all of a sudden there is COVID that actually can affect all the solutions. And so we have to consider all those as well. And because of the, of the uh, pandemic, it, the subscription box uh, solution actually presented a new opportunity because people cannot go to market and having their food delivered to their homes is another uh, great solution. And with the hit of, uh, of uh, the fires in California, it intensified some of our solution that yes, there is a demand for what, for to help the the people in in South in in Central America, and also how can we scale it up, you know, to other parts of the country be, uh, of the world because some of the people in our group are actually in other parts of the world and they are also in agriculture. So it's a very very interesting challenge for all of us, but it's it's quite. It's quite uh, exciting at the same time. Yeah, I think it's, I also think it's exciting. And you mentioned mm -hmm. the pandemic and I loved how um, you really incorporated that, obviously something that we couldn't have predicted, you incorporated that into the solution and it, it worked very well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about is um, how was it to work with your group? I know that it was remotely this year, but how was it to work with the LA chapter? Oh, it's very exciting because I have not met them in person just yet, but we had co communicated um, uh, through WhatsApp, through uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the, all, we kind of reach out to each other in different ways and uh, ask questions. And even uh, when we did the Instagram takeover, 
which I have not done before. Some of the people who had experienced it had supported the people that doesn't know how to do it. And it's kind of, uh, yes, we, had, we are trying to solve one problem. And at the same time, we're learning from each other through the different solution in terms of communication and also relationship and friendships. I love that. I love that. Um, and you could definitely tell like the cohesion of your group when you were giving your final presentation too. So yeah, I can attest to that. Yeah, and they up the early this morning, like supporting me, saying, uh, say, yeah, messages of support. So it's kind of neat. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And Flo, um, why did you select the Los Angeles Community Chapter Solution as the winner? Well, I tell you, it was a really hard decision because there were so many um, good submissions, but ultimately we chose the LA chapters proposal because we felt like it wedded so perfectly what SHI has already done with what we want to do. Um, and it covered a variety of ways to increase and diversify our income stream. But uh, for instance, the uh, subscription box idea, that takes something um, that we already do, which is to ask people to make monthly donations to support the work. And then it weds it with something we want to do to start exploring ways to market crops coming from uh, the farms in the program, but in a way that, that feels doable because it, it's connected to uh, the, this monthly relationship idea that we already have in place. And it's, it's not uh, where a plan where we have to set up a whole big uh, export business and be thinking about how to get containers of food to around the world and, and so on. It, it feels like a way that we can take a step in, into this world with the knowledge that we already have and a, an achievable amount of, of new capacity that, that we would add to the organization. Um, and um, Mafe already you know, noted some of the, the different uh, ideas that, that came through. Um, and we, we really liked how, how they were connected as, as she said. Um, so the, the idea of the subscription box can be connected to another idea like bringing in social media influencers uh, to, to further sp spread the word. Um, uh, the idea of connecting more with younger uh, people. Uh, uh, I think it, maybe we don't have uh, a big base of support from the younger generations. And so these ideas like getting more involved with social media with something like a subscription box um, that really appealed to us because it brings us in, into to new markets and um, helps us to connect with people that we haven't had the opportunity um, to connect with before. And, and I think I mentioned before the idea of using um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and connecting them with, with corporations that also want to help the world achieve these goals uh, and seeing how that could uh, bring in new partnerships and new types of support for sustainable harvest. Uh, all of that just you know, came together in a way that um, felt uh, like it, it could really make significant strides in furthering our work, but in, in a way that, that's achievable for us. And, and it, it jived with what some of the other chapters um, said as well. I, I, um, I think the Boston chapter, they also talked um, about the sustainable development goals and the possible corporate uh, partnerships and, and sponsorship that we could achieve. So when we saw the same idea coming from a few different <laughs> chapters, we knew it must be a good one. Um, and the LA chapter has, just did such a nice job of, of bringing the ideas all, all together in, into one package and, and a clear business plan, um, laying out the, the steps and some of the costs and, um, and the numbers that we'd be talking about and a, a real in-depth analysis to give us a sense of, of uh, what this would mean in, in terms of what we'd have to put in and uh, what we could potentially get out. Uh, definitely, it seemed very actionable, which I think was important. Yes. Yeah, and um, why don't you just share some of your big takeaways from being part of the community challenge? Um, well, I think uh, 
first and, and foremost, uh, we were all, again, just so impressed by the ingenuity and the depth of the proposals um, that were created. It was real, really impressive that um, these uh, alumni groups came together um, in, in such a profound way and, and gave their time to develop uh, these really in-depth proposals that that can really uh, benefit our world um, and, and our organization uh, as well, of course. Um, and it it served as a, as a good reminder that we are all better off and stronger when we come together from a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of locations, that that's really how we're going to move our world forward. Uh, to to a better place, and so I, I think that that was a big uh, takeaway for us that uh, nonprofit leaders need to be coming together with business professionals, and doing so on on a frequent basis in order to harness the business expertise for the social good that the nonprofits are are working on and, and the environmental good, and I guess the, um, the the last takeaway for me <laughs> was um, on a sort of internal basis was just um, the, the need for us as an organization to grow um, our capacity just to be able to uh, take advantage of some of these wonderful ideas that clearly present a big opportunity for us. Um, and thinking about our small staff, um, <laughs> it, it becomes clear that we really need to uh, build our capacity a bit more just to successfully embrace these wonderful ideas that have been presented to us by the LA chapters and, and the other chapters. Mafe, I'll turn the question on you now. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of your biggest takeaways from being part of the community challenge this year? Well, uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't put enough words in saying that our team I had done a great job in having the unity to actually accomplish what we wanted to accomplish in creating our submission. Um, and not only that, is uh, to be able to also enlist other people to support us, even outside Harvard Business Online, um, in, in furthering the cause, uh, because, and to clearly express to them what this cause me meant for not just for Central America, but actually it can affect the whole world. When we, when we address uh, and give solution to one part of the world uh, in terms of climate change, it actually affect the whole world. Uh, and uh, what a great cause for us to be part of. And um, uh, I'm just, I am just very fortunate to be part of it. And uh, I am grateful to HBS all, all online for putting this together. It's, um, it's just an amazing thing that we could actually uh, uh, put our thoughts into something that is productive and also something that is meaningful and with a bigger purpose. That's amazing. Yeah, and I'll say we're, we're very thankful for, for partnering with SHI and also for all of the learners who came together to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. without all of you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we actually have some time to take questions from the audience now. Um, so I have two right here. Uh, the first one is, how does SHI plan to expand the reach of their programs outside of the countries they currently work in? So Flo, this is for you. Okay. Um, well, uh, this is uh, a big part of our scaling up plans. As I mentioned, we're looking at how to have a more global impact and, uh, key to that we're quite certain is going to be partnerships, um, partnering with other organizations, um, with businesses, uh, maybe with government agencies to work with us to get the methodology we've developed over the last 23 years out to uh, a much larger number of, of farmers. And uh, in doing that, we'll be assessing where we feel we can have the greatest impact on improving standards of living, um, on improving the environment, and, uh, and then where we can find the right partners and, uh, and the funding to, to do the work. So all of those uh, will be factors that we take into consideration, uh, as well as, as logistics. Um, 
up to this point, we've only worked in Central America, so it, that's what we, we know uh, best. So I think we'll start out looking at how much more can we do in Central America. Um, and then once we uh, feel we have the answer to that question, uh, then we'll start to expand our circle out and look further uh, into Latin America and the Caribbean and eventually maybe uh, Africa and, and Asia as well, because uh, we, we feel really strongly that the basic tenets of our program can be um, adopted uh, or, and adapted to really at least anywhere in, in the global south in, in, in the tropics. That's great. Um, and the next question is, how is SHI responding and adapting to the global pandemic? Uh, <laughs> Um, well, um, I guess we're, we're lucky in that our headquarters was a virtual uh, headquarters before the pandemic. Um, so obviously we've uh, not been doing uh, the traveling that we might've done be before February, um, but we're able to, to keep uh, most of the work at the headquarters going as usual. Uh, the country programs have been affected more, of course, they weren't able for periods of time to be able to have the trainers go out to the communities uh, where we work be because of restrictions within the country and, and because, of course, we would want our staff to, to stay safe. Um, and so naturally, we've been encouraging um, all of our staff to take a uh, all of the precautions they need to to keep themselves and, and their their families well. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, they have been able to get back out to the communities again, which we're grateful for. And so they're doing that with the appropriate distancing and, and the mask wearing and and all of that. Um, during the times that they weren't able to go out and uh, visit the farms directly, uh, we, we did learn just how much communication was possible through things like cell phones. Um, it, it varied in, in the different countries. I, I think in, um, found that in one of the countries, maybe 80% of the families in the program had access to a cell phone, which we hadn't realized. In another country, it was more like 50%. In another, it was more like 20%. So there was some real variety, but such as it was, um, our local staff were able to learn how to communicate more by those means. And um, we also were really just bolstered and our, our commitment to this work was um, e even deepened even further by the communications that were initiated by farmers who were in the program, who sent messages, who sent photos, um, and at least one case even sent a video sharing how important their work with the Sustainable Harvest Program had been to them during the pandemic at a time uh, when their neighbors couldn't get to the market to buy food, uh, couldn't buy uh, fertilizers or things to grow their crops. They showed us how they were continuing to grow this rich diversity of food to feed themselves well and even help feed their neighbors because of what they had learned through our program. They'd learned to use resources that they had right there on their land uh, to grow this diversity of food and were able uh, to, to keep doing so to, despite the pandemic. And um, so getting those messages and uh, seeing uh, particularly the a video I'm thinking of from a man named Cirillo in, in Honduras uh, was very inspiring to us to keep doing everything we can uh, to further our work and expand our reach to more farmers. That's amazing. Um, and I'm really glad that you shared about that video too. I think that like, like that personal touch is like, it's always so meaningful. Yes. And uh, we, we have the video out there somewhere and I'm hoping one of my colleagues will be chatting or <laughs> uh, uh, helping people to find uh, the, the video on YouTube, I believe it is. Perfect. Um, and Flo, I just like to ask uh, what's in store for the future of Sustainable Harvest International? Uh, well, um, so I guess I touched on it a, a little bit already, but as I, I mentioned, we're working on plans for scaling up and uh, we're taking a three-pronged approach to this. Um, so first we're looking at continuing to strengthen and expand our well-established programs in Honduras, Panama, and Belize. Then at the same time, uh, as 
we expand those. We'll be using some of that expansion uh, as an opportunity to test new innovations uh, to the work, which is what the Harvard Business School online community has contributed to helping us think about what those innovations might be that will bring down the net cost of our program. And in that way, make it more scalable and make it easier to reach um, many more farmers uh, more quickly, which we, we feel is, is critical given the short time frame uh, that we feel we have to turn around the environmental situation for, for humanity. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, again, partnerships are gonna be key to this. Um, we've set uh, a really big um, audacious goal um, with a vision to impact a million farms by 2030 in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this would achieve food security and food sovereignty for 5 million people. And it would re reverse degradation on 8 million acres of land, um, as well as all the connected benefits of stabilizing the climate and um, increasing biodiversity. Uh, but we know that we're not, not gonna reach a goal like that on our own, that it's uh, going to be through partnerships. And this is again, an area where we see that Harvard Business School online community has already helped us to start to make some of those connections. And, and we think going forward could help us um, with, with more of those connections. And even though that, that million farm goal is, is a big and audacious one for a small organization uh, like ours, uh, personally, I, I don't feel like that's the end game either. Uh, those million farms, I hope, will help to set the example to achieve a paradigm shift for all 500 million of the world's smallholder farmers who can benefit from this kind of technical assistance and making this transition to regenerative agroecology practices. And if, if all 500 million of those smallholder farmers are able uh, to make that transition, they will be drawing down carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the soil and into the, the growing um, plants like the trees, um, which will signify 200 billion tons of carbon being drawn down and out of the atmosphere back onto these farms each year. And if you wed that with reductions in carbon emissions, um, it's, I think it's really the only way, but it is a way that we can get back to pre-industrial levels of carbon in the atmosphere and, um, and get ourselves a healthy planet that will continue to support humanity and, and allow us to thrive. So that, that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> um, we obviously are aware that we need to take it in um, small steps and some very thoughtful steps. Um, and so again, this is where some of the pieces we've worked on with Harvard Business School online community will come into place, like increasing and diversifying our income streams um, and bringing in some of these ideas that were, were given to us by the Harvard Business School online challenge. And, um, and then also I, I mentioned just to be able to embrace these ideas, uh, we need to build out our capacity, build out um, our headquarters staff a little bit to really take full advantage of these ideas. So um, part of our next step is doing some more fundraising. Um, we have a goal over the next couple of years to increase um, our funding by about $600,000 that will allow us to take these next key steps and then really launch into that big scaling up towards the 1 million farm goal to eventually um, set an example to, for the 500 million smallholder farmers around the world. So that's, that's what we're focused on now. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And it's really empowering to hear you speak about that. Um, and I think um, just if I'm speaking on behalf of anyone listening, um, how can people learn more about SHI? Um, well, we have um, a website, of course, which is uh, sustainableharvest.org. And uh, we're also active on uh, all of the, the social media on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and I believe my colleagues have put links to those um, in the chat. So um, people will um, be able to follow those. And um, I hope it's all right. I'll just uh, also mention that if people do follow any of those links, they'll see that we are doing a Giving Tuesday campaign today, which we're very excited about. Awesome. And we just actually 
had one more question come in. Um, if you're, if, yeah, we have a couple minutes. Uh, if you're ready, Flo. Um, another question that just came in from the audience is, in terms of soil depletion control, what is your stance on land rotation? And if it's something you're considering, how would this affect production and food security for the areas and population you're currently working with? Um, well, we, we teach a variety of practices um, uh, for, the, for the farms. We sort of offer a menu of all the different techniques that are regenerative um, and ecologically based. And then the farmers choose which ones to implement on their farms um, in consultation with, with the trainers who work with them on this. And as I said, a lot of it is about soil uh, conservation, soil management, building the soils up. Um, and so crop rotation is certainly one of the practices that we utilize for that purpose. Um, the term land rotation was mentioned, so I'm, I'm not sure if the person was asking about um, rotation and fallow periods, but um, that also would be one of the techniques that we would offer to the farmers and help them think about, um, especially if it's a managed fallow where uh, cover crops are incorporated in to uh, further build up the soil before uh, the other crops are, are planted during, during another season. Um, and we also use a variety of other uh, uh, practices for the soil, different types of composting, erosion barriers, uh, whether they're live barriers or dead barriers, um, uh, efficient microorganisms, um, um, and many other uh, techniques as well. So I, I hope that answered the person's question. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, fantastic. I'm really, really glad to have had this conversation with both of you. Um, it's been, like I said, empowering and inspiring and Mafe just hearing about the LA community chapter too. Um, yeah, I cannot thank you two enough for taking the time to have this conversation today. Mm -hmm. Um, and also thank you to everyone who tuned in. I'll just let all of you know that planning for the next community challenge is already underway and we will be providing more information by the spring of 2021. If you've taken a course with HBS Online before and you were inspired by today's talk, you can join the community by visiting community.myhbx.org. That's community.myhbx.org. There are 34 community chapters right now in the HBS Online community. Um, so you can sign up for the one that's closest to where you live, or you can also join our global chapter. So Flo, Mafe, thank you so much again for joining us. I had a great conversation with you today. And to everybody, happy Giving Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.